Ringraziamo il professor Gessa, sempre appassionato, oltre che essere una figura eh, importante per i suoi allievi, ma per tutta la città. Eh, adesso io sono onorata di dare la parola al professore Eric Candè, eh, premio Nobel per la medicina del 2000, che eh, ci fa l'onore di dare una lettura magistrale sul reduzionismo nell'arte e nel cervello, nelle scienze dell'arte e nelle scienze del cervello. Per cui un po' il professor Gessa mi ha anticipato una parte del suo discorso. Professor Candel, a lei la parola e grazie per essere qua. Thank you for coming to me. Thank you, Chancellor Professor Maria Del Zambo. Thank you, Professor Jesse, for that marvelous introduction. That is the longest introduction in my whole life that I've ever, ever had. A world record. You know more about me than I know about myself. Um, I also want to thank the people who invited me here, my friends, Paolo Fara, Walter Fata, and Philippe Meles made it possible for me to come here. Can you hear me in the back? Uh, this is my first visit and Denise's first visit to Calgary. And it's an absolutely magical visit for us. And I made a major discovery while I was here that probably none of you are aware of. There are more churches in Calgary than there are in any other city in the world. And you know, Philip, do you know why this is so? Because Calgary is closer to heaven than any other city in the world. The people are so nice. They're so friendly. The physical surroundings are so marvelous that you're very fortunate to live here. The way you interact with one another, the way you enjoy yourselves. Several people said, I could live in the north of Italy. I would never think of leaving here because it is so wonderful. So I feel very privileged, and so does Denise, for being able to spend a few days in this really magical environment. So I thought I would tell you today about a new direction in my work, uh, which involves the bridging of art and brain science. So this idea began with C.P. Snow, who in his Reed Lecture 1959 said he was a physicist who later became a novelist and he said the humanities and the sciences are world apart they don't communicate with each other because they have different goals and they use different methodologies to achieve those goals to advance human knowledge and society the two fields need to communicate with one another and i would like to suggest one way of bridging these two cultures and that is by bridging brain science and art this is not unique to me, other people are doing the same thing. Um, and you can do this for two reasons. One is that humanistic questions are often addressed by brain science. And we who study the brain see brain science as a way to address in direct and compelling fashion humanistically important questions. And for example, learning and memory is a humanistically important question. Similarly, conversely, the reductionist approaches are taken by art. Artists, particularly modern artists, often experiment in various ways in order to achieve their goals, and the methods they use in experimentation bear similarities to that used by scientists. Let me begin by addressing a humanistically important question from the point of view of brain science, the nature of learning and memory. You've already heard about this from Professor Jesse, but let me just repeat a little bit of this. Learning is a process whereby we acquire new information about the world, and memory is the process whereby we retain that knowledge over time. As a result, we are who we are, in large part what we learn and what we remember. Moreover, the study of learning has broad cultural ramifications. Our understanding of the world and its part derives from what we've learned and what we remember. In addition, learning transmits cultures across generations, is a major vehicle for social progress. It also drops, as I will show you in a moment, it drives top-down processing 
which is important for understanding art. Um, as you already heard from Professor Jesse, I brought a reductionist approach to the study of learning and memory. Why did I do so? The human brain, in fact, the mammalian brain in general, is extremely complex. The human brain is 86 billion neurons. That's a lot of nerve cells. A pussy has a very simple nervous system. It consists of only 20,000 nerve cells. So you can see that the task is made much, much simpler by using the pussy than using the human brain. Now you have to be a Darwinian, you have to sort of believe the fact that once evolution has found a successful strategy, it retains that throughout all of evolution. So my assumption was, and this is an assumption throughout all of biology, that a mechanism that is very general, if you find it in any organism, no matter how simple, is likely to be preserved. And that's the assumption I made here. So Blitzky has a very simple nervous system and has only 20,000 nerve cells. These nerve cells are distributed in 10 clusters called ganglia. Each ganglia has 2,000 nerve cells. Moreover, a single ganglia controls not one, but several different behaviors. So the number of cells committed to a single behavioral act can be quite small, 100 neurons, and even less. Not only does a plesia have few cells, but has the largest nerve cells in the animal kingdom. Before it became presbyopic, I could see them with my naked eye. Their largest cells are a millimeter in diameter. Moreover, they're not only large, they're always in the same position. The cells are unique. Each cell is in the same position in every animal of the species. So R2 is always over here, R14 always over here, L7 always over here. So you can return to the same cell in every animal. Moreover, you can map connections between cells in a very direct fashion. In this simple animal, you can study behavior. Like if you can just look at it, you can see this is a very beautiful animal. This is the sort of animal any one of you would select for the study of learning and learning. Moreover, this animal is very accomplished. There are many people that feel it's the Aplisa that should have gotten the Nobel Prize rather than the investigator. Uh, in this simple animal with a simple nervous system, I've selected a very, very simple behavior, a withdrawal reflex, like the withdrawal of a hand from a hot object. This is the head of the animal, this is the tail. It has a lung, a respiratory organ called the gill, which is outside the body, external to the body cavity. It is covered by a sheet of skin called the mantle shelf, which has a shell that protects the gill. And that mantle shelf ends in a fleshy spout called the siphon. If you now apply a weak tactile stimulus to the siphon, you get a very nice brisk withdrawal of the gill. Now this simple reflex can be modified by different forms of learning, habituation, sensitization, classical conditioning, and operant conditioning. I'm only gonna show you sensitization, learn fear as an example. If you apply a tactile stimulus I'm sorry, if you apply a shock to the, scare, to the tail and scare the animal, the same weak tactile stimulus to produce the modest withdrawal will now produce a much more powerful withdrawal. So the gill will withdraw much more powerfully. And the animal will remember this as a function of training trials. If you give one shock to the tail, it remembers it for minutes, gives a much more powerful withdrawal than it did before. If you give repeated trained trials, it remembers for days or weeks. So there's a short-term memory and a long-term memory. We could work out the neural circuit of the behavior. It was quite simple. Sensory neurons, the 24 of them, make direct connections onto the motor neurons, and the motor neurons make direct connections to the gill. So the sensory neurons connect from the siphon skin and the sensory neurons make direct connections onto the motor neurons. What happens when you stimulate the tail? You stimulate the tail, you activate modulatory neurons. These are serotonergic, like the serotonergic neurons at the, bas bas of, uh, at the back of your brain. And these serotonergic cells end on the sensory neurons, including on their presynaptic terminals. If you give a single shock to the tail, 
you produce a transient strengthening of synaptic connections between the sensory neurons and the motor neurons. So this was the first direct demonstration of what Cajal had predicted, that the communication between nerve cells, the synapses, are plastic. They can be modified by experience. And with short-term memory, you get a functional increase in synaptic strength. You release more transmitter from the presynaptic neuron. But when you give repeated ta uh, uh, tail shocks, you get something which is really surprising. You turn on gene expression and you grow new synaptic connections in your brain. So if you remember anything about this lecture tomorrow, and I don't urge on you, I urge you to forget it, but if you remember anything about this lecture tomorrow, it's because you will walk out of this lecture with a different brain that you walked into it, and all without even trying. So there are anatomical changes in your brain when you learn something for the long term. And this involves an alteration in gene expression mediated by CREB1, which gives rise to the growth of new synaptic connections. This growth in aplysia is quite strong. So this is a control sensory neuron before learning, and it has about 1,200 synaptic connections. But after learning, there's a doubling of the number of synaptic connections. This is much more dramatic than occurs in your brain, but nonetheless, there's an anatomical growth that occurs in your brain. And this was shown by Mike Merzenich. Mike Merzenich examined the representation of the body surface on the surface of the brain. And he did this in, in monkeys, and people have now done this in humans. This is the way you look to yourself on the surface of the brain. If you now take your fingertips, you see that they're represented in the sensory cortex. And before training, each finger has a sensory representation. But if you now use three fingers and you tap them repeatedly on the table like that, that representation will grow and that will persist for days if you repeat that training. So the same thing that hurt occurs in the snail occurs in the people and we have evidence for it in a variety of different ways. Now there's a reductionism in art as there is in science. Artists, like scientists, often use experimental approaches, reductionist methodologies, to achieve their goals. This idea has, has raised some concern among humanistic scholars that reductionist analysis will diminish our fascination with art, or will trivialize deeper issues. And this is, I strongly disagree with this view. I'm gonna to try to illustrate that scientific reductionism need not trivialize the richness of art, that artists often experiment like scientists do by focusing on certain aspects of art to the exclusion of others. And they found that reductionism can bring out a spiritual quality in the response of the viewer, as you will see in a little while. Henri Matisse appreciated this. At the end of his career, he was not strong enough to paint, so he did cutouts. He told people exactly how to cut it, and he would paste it together and he made a cutout of a snail, and he said, we are closer to achieving cheerful serenity by simplifying thoughts and figures, simplifying the idea to achieve an expression of joy. That is our only deed. And Immanuel Kant said, the sublime is to be found in a formless object, so far as in it or by occasion of it, boundlessness is represented. Let me show you an example from Turner. Uh, Joseph Mallard William Turner, the great British painter, loved to paint ships at sea. He loved to paint the fact that ships encountered this challenge at sea, the storm all of a sudden coming up, the skies are threatening, the waters are threatening, the boat is threatening to be overturned. This looks very scary. In fact, a very powerful image. Did this in 1803. He returned to this image later on, 40 years later, in a version which is much less detailed. If you didn't see the mast, you would not realize that you're looking at a boat at sea. Yet despite the fact that the details are, are, are reduced dramatically, the power of the ocean and the power of the skies is even more has an even greater impact on you
because you can see the struggle and your imagination fills in much greater detail than the literal depiction can do. So this calls in your imagination more and you see the struggle even more powerfully. Turner evokes in us an even greater emotional response when he's abstract than when he's figurative. Now, how is this greater emotional response produced? And that is the concept of the beholder share. Alois Regal was a famous Viennese art historian. And he was the first one that said, art history is gonna die unless it becomes more scientific. And the science it should relate itself to is psychology, and the question it ought to address is, how does the viewer respond to a work of art? Now that's the most obvious question in the world. How, about, how come no one ever addressed to it? Well, people knew that the painter painted in order to have people look at it, but no one said, what are the mechanisms that are going on that allow the viewer to respond in one way or another to a work of art? This was a great challenge, and it was taken up by two of his disciples, Ernst Chris, whom I knew quite well, and Ernst Gombrich, who I knew only slightly. Uh, Ernst Chris said, great art is ambiguous. When you and I look at the same painting, for example, we look at the painting of this very distinguished general in the back, we see it slightly differently. You and I see it slightly differently, even though we're looking at the identical painting. What does that mean? Chris pointed out that each of us in our own brain are recreating that image and we create it in a somewhat different way. That is, even in looking at a work of art, the beholder undergoes in a very modest way the creative act that the artist undergoes in painting it. Now, obviously, it's infinitely greater creative capability to make the work of art, but nonetheless, when you look at it, you have to exercise a certain creative potential in order to do that. So the beholder recapitulates in his own brain a parallel process to that which the artist undergoes. Ernst Gombrich was fascinated by this problem. He began to study visual perception, how we perceive something. So he began to study the cognitive psychology of visual perception. And he read Bishop Berkeley, and he learned about the inverse optics problem. And that is, when I look at a, a person in the audience, for example, I look at the face of my attractive wife, Denise, my retina does not see her face the way I see her face. My retina only sees the photons that are bouncing off her face. That information, the photons bouncing off her face, is inadequate to allow me to reconstruct the knees the way I see her. And I do see her, I see her the same way every day. And you, when you look at her, see her the same way. So obviously, there's additional information besides the photons bouncing off her face that has influenced my perception. And Helmholtz pointed out there are two sources of information, bottom up and top down. The bottom up information is that our brain has evolved over millions of years. So it's learned a lot of rules, automatic rules for perception. So if I see a source of light, I immediately assume it's above because the sun, the major source of light, is above. If I see a person much larger than another person, I assume that it's closer than the person who is smaller. So they were built into our brains automatic, almost reflex responses for making many decisions of what we see in the world. But in addition to these bottom-up processes, we all live slightly different lives and we've learned different things. So there's top-down processing, the learned processing that also influence what we see. So in addition to the reflex actions, there are also learned experiences that we bring to bear on this. Let me just show you an example of the automatic reflex actions because if it's a reflex action, this automatic bottom-up process, it's accurate 95% of the time, but occasionally it makes slight errors. Uh, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. You see here there's a black square lying on top of four white circles. Do every one of you see this black square Please raise your hand so I can make sure you understand it. 
You all see it. You see it clearly, do you? Philippe, are you seeing that clearly? Absolutely. It's not there. You're making it up. It's absolutely not there. It's fictitious. If I rotate these four quasi semicircles, that square disappears. You're filling in that square because these spaces in the white circles allow you to do it. This is completely bottom up processing, but it's made a mistake. This will happen occasionally. There's also top down processing. Uh, for example, if you see a wild animal, you may realize that, you know, this is the same animal you saw in a circus. And now the animal is a little bit more familiar with it because you recall seeing it in the circle. So this top-down process acts on the fact that you have the bottom-up process, you recognize the animal, and you have a learning process that occurs that puts the two together, and you now associate the two very effectively. So in addition to bottom-up, there's top-down processing. Now, how do we respond to the reduction of form and of color? And this brings me to the major theme I want to develop, and that is the New York School of Abstract Expressionists. Clement Greenberg, a major art critic of the period, divided the abstract expressionists into two major groups, the gestural paintings and the color field paintings. The gestural painters were William de Kooning and Jackson Pollock, and the color field painters were Mark Rothko, Morris Lewis, and Barnett Newman. Let me begin with the gestural painters. The gestural painters begin with William de Kooning, who is probably the most important American painter. He's considered by many to be just a step below people like Picasso and Matisse, one of the great painters of the 20th century. He altered the vocabulary of painting and even the notion of what painting is about. He fused cubism, which is emphasis on flatness and being able to view the same object from several perspectives, and surrealism, which emphasizes unconscious mental processes. In his early paintings, he liked to paint the woman he was going to marry, Elaine Freed. And even though this is largely figurative, there were already some abstract elements. This arm is not complete. This arm is translocated from the shoulder. This leg, again, you don't quite know what it ends. So he's bringing together combinations of abstraction and figuration. But with time, it became completely abstract. This is one of his greatest paintings called Excavation, sort of a fusion of surrealism and cubism. You see fantastic and wonderful movement in the painting, which is really characteristic of his art. But if you look very carefully, you can talk yourself into seeing figures, even in this abstract image. And this was a characteristic feature of de Kooning's art. See little figures sort of jumping around here. And even though he had this abstract mode, he would periodically come back and do figurative paintings again. And he'd like to come back and paint images of a woman, some alteration of his wife. And it was interesting he depicted her. On the one hand, she's clearly you know a feminine representation. You see a bosom, but her face has an angry aspect out, out of it. And it's sort of a fusion of, of eroticism and aggression. And he showed us that women often show this. We have always known that men show it, but he showed that women do it. Now this raises the question, why is it so easy to fuse eroticism with aggression? Why do we do it so easily? Why do artists do it so easily? And that emerged only recently. And let me tell you a little bit about how the brain handles eroticism and aggression. These instinctive modalities are represented in the structure of the brain called the hypothalamus, and this is controlled by a structure called the amygdala and modified by modulatory transmitted dopamine. Now, if you look in the hypothalamus, you find to your surprise that the neurons that are involved in aggression and the neurons that are involved in mating and eroticism are right next to each other. They're contiguous with one another. And in the middle, there's 20% of cells that overlap. They can participate in eroticism and they can participate in aggression. If you stimulate them weakly, eroticism. If you stimulate them strongly, aggression. So you can see 
with this fusion of the two and the zone in between, you can easily go from one to the other. De Kooning often went back and forth between figuration and abstraction. Later in his life, there were two interesting phases. One, he became influenced by Soutine, who used very thick paint, which provided a tactile feature to it. So when you stood in front of the painting, not only did you get a visual excitation, but you could actually feel it with your fingertips. And he varied the speed with which he moved his brush stroke. So it gave you a sense of the eye moving around all the time. But what was fascinating about de Kooning, and this is not unique to him, is that late in his life, he developed Alzheimer's disease. He would walk in, around his apartment in a maze, but when he went next door to his studio, he would be a different person. And he continued to paint while he had Alzheimer's disease, almost until the time that he died. And I don't know whether any of you saw the wonderful retrospective a couple of years ago in MoMA. The later paintings are magnificent. They're simpler than the earlier paintings, but as is the case with other artists with Alzheimer's disease, people can continue to be creative in Alzheimer's disease under the right circumstances. A contemporary of his and a major rival was Jackson Pollock. He worked in the Midwest with a regional painter, and his early work had these qualities of abstract, swirling painters that bore some resemblance to the man who trained him. He then became a little bit more abstract. He did this very famous painting, The Teacup, just as he was about to get married. This was under the influence of Picasso. He had tea with Lee Krasner, the woman that he married. Here you have a loss of perspective, and you have a balance between figuration, which you see here and here, and abstraction, which you see in the rest of it. But then he did something absolutely fantastic. He decided that, why do we have a painting on the wall? I can work in that painting much better if I don't paint on the wall, if I took the painting and put it on the floor, and instead of putting paint on it systematically, if I splattered it with paint. So he put the painting on the floor, and he just boom, 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 walked around it and splattered it. This was an absolute revolution. No one had ever done this before. He was drawing in space, so an immense network of overlapping lines, drips, and splatters of paint, a reflection of his inner being, his unconscious mind. De Kooning, who was his big rival, said, this is a major revolution. He said, every so often, a painter has to come and destroy painting so he can bring out a new perspective. Cezanne did this. Cezanne said, why do we pretend that a painting depicts a three-dimensional image? A painting is flat. Why don't we tell the truth and deal with it as flatness? Picasso showed us cubism, that you can see an image from many different perspectives. And Pollock did this with the idea of easel painting. No more easel painting. We put it in the ground, and we splattered it. So he really made several great reductionist advantages. He abandoned traditional composition, no points of emphasis, no identifiable parts. Your eyes move constantly over the image. And by turning painting into a series of action paintings, Pollock eliminated the separation between work and art. All of it becomes the same. A contemporary abstract artist who took a very different direction was Mark Rothko. He started off, as all of these people did, as a figurative artist, became more abstract, even more abstract. Now you could maybe imagine that there were two people holding hands. But after a while, he decided he's not interested in anything else about people. He's not even interested in a relationship of color or form. I'm only interested in expressing basic human emotion, tragedy, ecstasy, and doom. And he thought he could do that best by geometric abstraction. In the early paintings, he used bars of color, like bars of different degrees of black and red against the background. And a reproduction in no way does justice to Mark Rothko because each of these bars is made up of layers of paint, which you can't see in the reproduction. But if you stand in front of it, 
you see the deeper layers coming through. You see sparkling coming through. And I sat in front of these, one of these uh, Rothko paintings a number of years ago, and I said to myself, you think you're a reductionist? You're nothing compared to this. This brings out a tremendous spiritual quality, which is just remarkable. He then simplified it even more, and the most fantastic things, have any of you been to Houston and seen the Rothko Chapel? Anybody in the room? I was there just about three weeks ago, and I went there again. It's the most fantastic experience. You look at these, there are seven black paintings in this dark chapel. You stand in front of it and you see absolutely nothing. Then after a while, if you keep on looking, you see there's movement. There's movement on the canvas. You are hallucinating the movement. The image forces you to see movement, but the movement is not even there. It's the most fantastic experience you can imagine. Rothko influenced other people. One of the people he most influenced is Morris Lewis, who took a variant approach. He poured the paint in very careful ways in strips. This is his early figurative work. But here, he began to do what he called the unfurled, in which he dripped paint along the side of the canvas, symmetrically in the two sides. What is remarkable about this canvas, besides these flares? Anybody put up your hand and say, what is remarkable about this painting? Yes. Brilliant. What you first look at when you look at a painting is the top of the canvas and the center. He's got nothing there. And nonetheless, he draws your attention. So he's willing to sacrifice the most important part of the canvas in order to bring out this wonderful sensation in you. At the end of his career, he used another combination of these stripe series coming down. This is the most reductionist of his work. Turner de Kooning, Pollock, Rothko, and Lewis all illustrate that reductionism does not distract from the mystery or beauty of art, but draws our attention to detail, spirituality, and complexity that is deeply satisfying because it encourages the beholder's own imagination and creativity. So when you look at a reductionist painting, because there is very little figurative detail, you yourself have the opportunity to imagine, to superimpose your own creativity on top of it. And one of the reasons abstract art is so enjoyable to so many people is because it allows you to bring your own artistic capabilities to bear on it. So what Turner, de Kooning, Pollock, and Rothko and Lewis illustrate is reductionism does not detract from the mystery or beauty of art, but draws our attention to detail, spirituality, and complexity that is deeply satisfying because it encourages the beholder's own imagination and creativity. And I would argue that one of the reasons science is so satisfying to those of us who practice it is if you go into the lab and you have the lousiest little idea, you put two things together, it is so satisfying, it makes you feel good for the rest of the day. So, Turner, de Kooning, Pollock, they all illustrate that reductionism does not detract from the mystery or beauty of art, but draws our attention to detail and spirituality and complexity that is deeply satisfying because it encourages creativity in us. And using a reductionist framework, many modern artists, Richard, Sarah, Charclos, see themselves as problem solvers, as much as scientists do. I did a program on television with Richard, Sarah, and Charclos, and they said to uh, me, we do not consider ourselves creative. We are problem solvers. We take a task for ourselves and we solve it. Very much like those of us who work in a laboratory do for ourselves. So why is reductionism so successful in arts? I show you again the picture of Turner and then the abstract version. When the details are reduced, it stimulates more of your own top-down processing. The ship is merely suggested by this line, but the twirling suggests to you the churning of the ocean, the threatening of the sky, and your imagination brings out 
greater chaos, greater fear than does the literal depiction. The more you can rely on your own imagination in an abstract work of art, the more powerful it becomes for you. Now, what is interesting is that abstract art in the United States not only influenced other abstract artists, but it had an influence on figuration. There are some people who felt more comfortable working with figuration, but nonetheless, in view of this powerful New York school, they began to be influenced by them. And the first example of this, and one of the most dramatic examples, is a guy called Alex Katz, who began to do figurative painting, but very much influenced by the abstract artists. He painted in very flat, very few colors, and very, very simply. So this is a depiction of his wife, Sarah. Look how flat this is. He doesn't so much try to bring out emotional expression, but simply the beauty, the harmony of her face. Again with this picture of Joan. And a Winotaur, all of them very, very similar. He captures beauty in a very, very reduced, but very nice way. He had a big influence. This is Robert Rauschenberg. He liked to do doublets. Had a very big influence on Andy Warhol. <clears throat> this is Katz. And this is Andy Warhol's picture of, uh, of Jackie Kennedy. Again, doublets. Marilyn Monroe. So the development of abstract expressionism by de Kooning, Pollock, and Rothko and its later evolution into neofiguration by Katz and Warhol led to two new developments in the world of art. One, the center of art moved from Paris to New York until the abstract expressionists came along in the mid-40s. European art was dominant, particularly French art. But beginning with the abstract expressionism, New York became a major art center. And it was the beginning of an attempt to develop a cognitive neuroscience of the beholder share. There is now a trend in the United States, my colleagues and I trying to do this, to make the beholder share more objective. And one way to do it is to use construal theory. I don't know whether you are familiar with the fact construal theory. Construal th th uh, theory points out that many of your logical operations follow certain rules. And that you make a distinction between whether something is near or something is far. And by near, I mean near in space or near in time. Far is, again, near in space and near in time. So if I tell you I'm going to build a hotel tomorrow across the street from this building, and I want to mark the ladies' room and the gentlemen's room how should I do it? Most of you would say, I would use a cartoon that would illustrate a man and a woman. If I were to tell you I'm putting up that hotel, not next door, but 20 blocks away, you would say, I would write, ladies and gentlemen. Not only in terms of space, but also in time. If I say I'm going to put up that hotel tomorrow, figuration, I'm going to put it up a year from now, you would say, write it out. If you do 100 people, you'd be amazed how many people follow that rule. So it began to dawn on us that maybe this also applies to figurative versus abstract art. Figurative art is close by in space and in time. Abstract art is more distant. We've now done hundreds of subjects, showing them a figurative, intermediate and abstract art, and it's exactly the way they do it. They see the abstract art as being far further in space and in time. So it looks like there's a common logic that people use, and we now want to do imaging experiments on subjects to see how do we want to respond to abstract art versus figurative art. So this is all that I have to say. I want to thank you very much for your attention. I'd be delighted to take any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Thank you.
I want to add some. Uh, we have a translator here who can help you if you have difficulty. I'd be glad to answer any questions that you have. I may not succeed, but I will try. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, you gave us uh, a, an incredible emotion <laughs> today with, the, with your lecture. And, you know, just think about the fact that uh, a Nobel Prize for Medicine <laughs> is talking on art uh, with this, uh, uh, you know, ability uh, to explain and to appreciate art is something that's incredible, you know. So thanks for this. Uh, thanks for this. May I answer you? You make a very interesting point. And this relates to my wife, who has been a major influence in my life. Um, and that is, um, I received the Nobel Prize in the year 2000. Two or three years before that, I received a telephone call while we were on vacation together from somebody at the NIH, the funding agency, that said I was going to be funded for my grant. In those days, if you could read and write, you were funded. At the end of the telephone conversation, he said, we here think you're going to get the Nobel Prize. I come and I tell Denise, he thinks I'm going to get, they think I'm going to get the Nobel Prize. And Denise said, I hope not soon. I said, how can you, my wife, <laughs> say something like that? And she said, you know, when I was getting my PhD, my PhD supervisor was studying Nobel laureates in physics. And after they get the Nobel Prize, <laughs> they get invited to Cagliari. They see these churches. They have a wonderful time. They have great meals. Have you ever gone and had a meal in a Cagliari restaurant? Every fish that you have. Every del is different. It's made specially here. So you just fall in love with this. How can you think ideas if you live here? How can you continue to do experiments? So you still have a number of ideas. Play them out. Lots of time to win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so when I won the Nobel Prize, I had to demonstrate to Denise that I'm still intellectually alive. And if you, <laughs> and if you come this afternoon, how do you show to your wife that you're intellectually alive? You collaborate with her. <laughs> so we start a collaboration, and we will talk about that this afternoon. So, but anyway, I've had a very privileged existence since the Nobel Prize, because and, and I have Philippe here, who is my collaborator. We continue to do wonderful science. I have a wonderful lab, of course, that does the, really the important work. But in addition, I've been able to do additional things. So someday I may write a book called There's Life After the Nobel Prize. <laughs> it begins in Cagliari, but it goes on. <laughs> eh, allora, il professor Candel <clears throat> ha detto che se c'è qualche domanda, eh, you say that if there is some question uh, you want to answer. Absolutely. Okay. Normalmente le lezioni magistrali non permettono una discussione, no? Però, visto che lui l'ha chiesto, se c'è uno o due domande, soprattutto dai colleghi più giovani, siamo qua, se c'è qualche curiosità. Just one, maybe, one. Ok. Come here, come here. Please, eh, vieni qua. Ah. Uh. Yeah, Please afternoon. present you. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Rahul Bhartia. I am under the. Uh, I have been enrolled into the PhD course under Professor Malice in the in the field of neuroscience, and I came from India. Uh, my question is to Professor Eric. Like uh, he has explained us regarding his model using the snail as an animal. So what was the logic? You have chosen not mice or other animal and correlated your work with the work of this uh, snail with the human correlation in terms of cognition and learning. I see. Uh, what is the relationship between what I found in snails and what is found in human beings? Yes. Uh, before I worked on the snail, there was no evidence for how learning occurred. Cajal had suggested that synapses change but other people had suggested other ideas. One didn't know what the facts were because no one had any experimental evidence for it. So I was the first person to show that learning involves changes in the strength of synaptic connections. 
and that long-term memory involves growth of synaptic connections. That has now been confirmed in every system that one has looked at. And there's indirect evidence in humans, but direct evidence in monkeys and rats and cats, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. okay. So, and uh, can I ask another question? Sure. Uh, sorry. Uh, the other thing, like uh, Snell, as far as I know that it's a very, uh, the animal which lives in a very uh, moist area and all. So like if we correlate this animal model with the stress condition, if the animal has been located at a stress condition rather than in a very comfortable zone, then how that will be able to like help in the long term memory and short term memory? We have done the experiments. Let me repeat the question. Yes. The gentleman asked me, the animal normally lives in, is immersed in seawater. What happens if he was in land? We do most of the experiment with the animal in land and it behaves perfectly well, just like it does in seawater. It doesn't make any difference. Okay. The learning is the same. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Grazie. Thanks. Uh, grazie al professor Candel.